I think we'll get started. We're on life, life, light, and love, and we're going to be in 1 John 1, 5 to 8, an invitation to live in the light. And so, um, as we've been doing our person of the week this week from back in my youth, <laughs> uh, is uh, Larry Norman. And this is going to be a little bit weird because uh, Larry died in uh, 2004. Uh, but this is from 1993, and he had been in the hospital some, and it's going to start out because he's in a, they're in a hospital in uh, Holland, and so this guy is going to talk a little Dutch to start with, and then it'll switch to English as his interview starts. And uh, the, the reason I chose Larry is because, uh, you know, last week we did the um, song that Randy Matthews sang, uh, Didn't He, which is in the Hammer Fell which is a real powerful song. The first time I heard that was Larry Norman sang it in Dallas, and uh, he had a real kind of gra uh, gravelly voice, and it was really a powerful thing. So that was my first introduction to him. Um, but let's pray before we get started. Heavenly Father, thank you for this class today. Uh, we just ask for your Holy Spirit to guide us in uh, the words that I say and the things that we hear your Holy Spirit speak to our hearts about how to live in the light, and just uh, help us do what you would wish to be done. In your name I pray. Amen. Okay, so we'll, we'll play Larry's... Hij is een open voor tegen van deze tijd. Met radicale uitspraken maakt hij veel vrienden, maar soms ook vijanden. En pas was hij hier in Nederland voor een afscheidstoernooi. Na zijn laatste concert werd hij helaas afgevoerd met ernstige hartklachten naar het ziekenhuis. En het was inmiddels zijn derde attack. Ik ben bij hem op bezoek gegaan in het ziekenhuis. En gelukkig was hij inmiddels weer fit genoeg om met hem te praten. Larry Norman. that I should have worried so much 
about small things that don't matter. When you when you realize how much control God has over your death and your life, then why shouldn't you worry about, oh, what happens in five years? Shall I lose my job? Oh, uh, shall I ever find someone to love me? Well, we shouldn't worry about that. We should just think about today. We should say each day to God, I trust you to take care of me today. And I will also take care of myself. I will try to live in the right way. And worry, don't worry about tomorrow. Only worry about right now. Larry wrote that song, and we probably all have heard it at some point, but uh, he wrote a lot of really uh, strange titled songs. Uh, Why Does the Devil Have All the Good Music was one. <laughs> and uh, just a, he had some just crazy titles, and he was really just blunt and out there, and that's the way I think what we see in First John, that John was that way. John is very blunt very straightforward with us, very out there. And um, what we're going to look at today, I don't want to be, um, look like, you know, like Larry talked about, we think sometimes God is a judge and he's marking off the sins that we do, writing them down and we're, you know, we got to, uh, that that's what he's doing and that's not what he's doing at all. And, and when we read, uh, when we're reading 1 John 1, 5 to 8, it's going to seem like that if we're in that mentality, but God is not doing that. John is doing, saying what he's saying to uh, help us to live a kingdom life, to help us to live our life here. And um, well, you put that up there. Let's do, uh, let's see, if you want to turn in your Bibles, you can too, to 1 John 1, 5 to 8, which is uh, where we're going to work through hopefully most of it today. Uh, someone want to someone want to read verse five? <laughs> Go ahead. This is the message we have heard from him. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you: God is light; in Him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have <laughs> Gonna keep it. That's all right. Uh, so it, the the point in there that John is making is God is light, and in Him there is no darkness at all. And the question I put up there is, you know, we, we can say these things, but what do they really mean? So, what in your mind, what is God saying in that verse? What is living in the light, which we're talking about? What is that? Uh, what are some words that might describe that uh, in your mind? Okay. Follow Christ when? Yeah, following Christ's directions, his instructions for us. Okay. What else? What is 
Uh, following truth. <coughs> I think, I don't know how to say what I'm trying to say, but you do things that you know are wrong in the dark, so when you live in the light, you do the right thing. Yeah. Doing the right things. What else? Okay. Um, Think back to the bracelet that used to be out a lot. It's like, what would Jesus do? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Sure. I think being positive is part of it too. Right? Just the fact that if you're always looking at the negative things of everything, or the dark side of everything. You're going to go down that hole. You're going to go down that rabbit hole. Yep. So just focusing on everything that's positive. You bet. <coughs> positive. Positive thinking. Anything else? Hope. Hope. Meaning what? Well, if you live in the darkness, and sometimes I don't think there's much hope. Yeah. And if you live in the light, you have hope. Yeah. There's hope for tomorrow, hope for today, hope for tomorrow, hope for, you bet. Um, about uh, live authentically. Um, be real. That spark any thoughts? Love. Love. Uh, open. Not not hidden. Open. Not hidden. We could probably put down. More things, but you're on the right track. It's it's uh, um, doing the right things. Living in the light is or is you're not ashamed or embarrassed about what you're doing, and so all of these things fit into there. Uh, what about so if we're, if we're going to do this? What about what's uh, what's living in the dark? Because we're going to John talks about both. Living in the light, living in the dark. Pretty much should be the opposite of most of the things we've written up there. Yeah. Opposites of those. Anything in particular? Lost. Feeling evil. Evil deeds. Pardon me? Yeah. Yeah, which would fit right in there, wouldn't it? Any other things? One of, one of the ones I had on that I didn't write on here was to uh, be transparent, to be able to be uh, 
to not to not be hiding, which is what uh, John was talking about there. Um, turn to uh, Psalm 139, if you would. Psalm 139. Twenty-three and twenty-four. Psalm one thirty-nine, verses twenty-three and twenty-four. David, which we studied last year, <clears throat> had a particularly good way of putting things that had to deal with a personal, his own personal nature, or the things that were going on in in his life. This is the first one that we'll look at of his. But yeah, one thirty-nine, verses uh, twenty-three and twenty-four. Someone have that. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way of the in the way everlasting. Okay. Your words in there, didn't they? Yeah. <laughs> so, the, so David in those verses had been living over here in darkness, and and he comes. What were what were David's problems? Which we've went over la all like last fall. Girls. <laughs> <laughs> he likes certain particular girls he shouldn't have. <laughs> so he he had all the power as a king. Uh, had this whole adultery thing turned into murder, turned into um, hiding uh, problems in his family. So he continued to live in the dark until who stepped into his life? Who is the guy that stepped into his life? God through what man? Psalm. Nathan. Nathan, his best friend, stood up, came to him and said, God told me, David, you're messing up. You're doing the wrong things. You're not what you're not what you look like. You're hiding all of these things. And David could have done a couple of things. He could have said, Nathan, you're done, out of here. But he took it to heart, and, and this is what he had written uh, or put down, Psalm 139, which is a, a repentant heart, a heart that wants to come back to God. And so what, is, what are some of the first words, the first word he uses in, in verse 23 is what? Search me. Search me, O God. So what we've got on the wall there are, are things to remember. The first one is a desire for God to change. So that's right where David started. He said, search me, O God, and know my what? What? My heart. Yes, my heart. Search me, O God, and know my heart, which is what number two is, isn't it? Come on in. Search me, O God, and know my heart, which is number two. He gave access to God, didn't he? So David had a desire to get things right with God, and then he t gave God access. Search me, O God, and know my heart, and see what? If there be any wicked way in me. So he, and then he went on to number three. He paid attention to what God said through Nathan and otherwise, and then partnered with God, in the fellowship with God. So David... Uh, God giving us this account in 139 gives us a pattern of what God wants us to do uh, as part of our life. Um, there's a continual invitation for God, from God to reveal what there is about us to be open. Um, God does not, because if we start to cover or conceal, it's going to become a way of life, and it's going to be something that we are going to continue to do uh, out of habit, and so if we don't uh, come into a kind of a, into a daily accounting with God, so that we keep things current, it just gets to be building, and you start hiding and hiding and hiding more. Um, uh, verse six of First John one. Someone want to take that one? If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live off the truth. Okay, so what is what does John say in there? What's his point? We 
talk the talk but don't walk the walk. Okay, if we talk the talk and don't walk the walk, it's a it's a lie. And our, we always ask questions, so what is the lie? If you read that verse, what is he saying we're lying about? That you're claiming to be a Christian and you're not. You're, you're Close. Claiming you're claiming fellowship. You're claiming fellowship. Yeah, you're, you're claiming fellowship. The very last one, you're claiming fellowship and partnership with God when you're not. That's the lie, isn't it? I mean, we all, we all sin and we all make mistakes. And, but if we lie about that, lie about that we are, that we, if we lie that we are in partnership with God and continue to do what's wrong, that's, where he's at, that's what he's after in verse 6. If we say we have fellowship or partnership with him and yet walk in darkness doing the wrong things, uh, we lie and do not practice the truth. Pretty plain spoken, isn't he? Um, verse 7. But... Someone take that one. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. Okay. Kind of a interesting verse. Um, but if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, so who is he talking about he himself? What would you take from that verse? Who is he referring to? Jesus and God. Yeah. Jesus and God. Um, if we walk in the light, we have fellowship. And then, and then what will happen if we do that, if we walk in the light? Which is, I, I just stuck out to me when I was reading that. We will have fellowship or partnership. Not just with him, but with one another. Yeah. This is going to affect every area of my life. It's, it's my relationship with God, for sure. It's my relationship with you, with my family, with my people that I work with. Uh, this hiding thing, uh, hiding in our lives, is going to affect all parts of our life. And most importantly, starting with our relationship with God. Um, and then the last part, the blood of Jesus as His Son cleanses us from all sin. Um, read, uh, I should probably go to 1 John 1, 9. Someone want to read that, please. If we, if we confess our sins, <laughs> he is not faithful, he is faithful and just and will <laughs> forgive us our sins and purify us from all our unrighteousness. Okay, 1 John 1, 1.9 is a real familiar verse. If we will confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness so we can start out clean. But weren't, we, uh, weren't our sins all paid for at the cross? So what is He talking about? If we confess what? If our sins are all taken care of... You're walking in the light. I can, you're continually... Examining or open asking God to examine your heart as we began the discussion. And there'll still be continued areas that need to be sanctified or cleansed. And walking in the light causes that to happen. Yeah. And possibly twofold, though, we could be talking to these people at the time that were claiming that uh, in a false doctrine that sin doesn't even exist anymore. You know, I think you might be talking to two different audiences. I'm sure, yeah. But for us as believers, it's just that continual cleansing process because that goes on and on in the religious world. And, uh, so it's not the saving forgiveness that he's talking about here, it's a relationship issue in the to Yeah, exactly. I, the, if, um, oops, where's my. There is. Uh, Redemptive, what was the word I used? Redemptive forgiveness. Which means that when Jesus died on the cross, he paid for sins past, 
present, and future. So our sins are all taken care of at the cross. That, that, that part, and, and some, uh, just a few verses, to you can go to Ephesians, I think it was Ephesians 4, no, Ephesians 1, 4, 2, 5. Someone want to read that? Ephesians 1, 4 to 5. Go ahead. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure. Okay. And then uh, someone, verse 7 to 9. And then uh, 9 through 14, or 10 through 14. To be put into effect when the when times were, have reached their fulfillment, to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one God, even Christ. To him, who were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him, who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his love. In order that we will, we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having been, having believed, you were marked in him with the seal, the promise of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Then we, we could also add uh, Hebrews 4. 15 and 16, I think. Yep. If you're writing them down. And then Ephesians 4.30. So the, the Bible is clear that all, all of our sins are paid for. Uh, so when we, when we get to 1 John 1, 1.9, we're not talking about redemptive forgiveness anymore. We're talking about relationship forgiveness. So if you've, if you've raised children or if you've ever been a child and have done something wrong and, and you uh, come into the house and... Uh, uh, Things aren't right between you and your dad or you and your mom. How, how do how do kids act? How do we act as children? Hey, Dad, how you doing? Nice to see you today, isn't it? You know, things change. You know, you you try and change subjects, or you try and uh, hide this or that, and until it all finally comes out, and you find out what went wrong. And uh, uh, do you have that picture of that tractor I sent you? I sent her a picture of my uh, tractor this morning, which is a little strange. It's uh, my, <coughs> I grew up, well, I've spent my whole life on a farm, basically. This is a tractor, <clears throat> I bought it last year. <clears throat> it's just like the one my dad had when uh, he would go and shell corn for the neighbors. And... Uh, and uh, these are trees. Our our house was like here, and uh, our driveway, our driveway circled out like this in the road. And I would see Dad coming home with the tractor. And during the day, Dad had parked. We had a really nice 1953 Chevy, blue and white car. I thought it was really cool, and I was getting got myself in mischief, 
And this was at a slight incline. And so I was sitting there in the afternoon and messing around and I got it out of park. And all of a sudden my car started rolling down toward this grove of trees. And so I was frantically trying to jam that thing into park. And thank God I got it into park about six feet before I got to the trees. And so my mom comes out of the house and sees me sitting over here in the car. And uh, mom would discipline me for things that weren't real serious. When it got to be serious things like wrecking the car, that fit into dad's category. And so I'd hear this tractor, it's a 1955 case 400 coming down the road. I can hear that thing today as well as I did back then. And so what I did, I got out of the car and I went and hid by some trees over here and thought, you know, I don't know how I'm going to get out of this thing. So dad comes, comes pulling in, pulls down the driveway and we had some gas barrels here. He parked there and then he walked to the house and I sat in the trees and I sat in the trees and I sat in the trees. It was pretty quiet and then dad came outside and we had a cement stoop out in front and he sat down on there. I think he knew I had to come in the house sometime or I was going to starve to death out there. So I, I started, wiggled my way out of the trees and I walked up there and I said, hey dad, how was your day? You know, all of the things that you want to, oh, pretty good. How'd the shelling go, dad? Oh, good. How much you get done? Oh, about 2,000 bushels or whatever it was. And, and so then I'd sit down beside him and you knew, I knew what was coming and he knew what was coming and he hated spanking me when he wasn't there. But that's what came, and so then he, we discussed what I had done and, and how I could learn to not do that again. <laughs> and so then we, mend, we mended this relationship. I needed relationship forgiveness. If I hadn't have gotten that, that would have been between me and Dad for a long time. But that got fixed that day. And in a lot of ways, with our relationship with God, we don't fix these things right away. Like we, like we need to do with our parents if we want to eat. We can go on days and weeks and years without fixing a relationship, without getting relationship forgiveness, which is 1 John 1, 9. God says, I want to fix this relationship. I want to do number four. I want to continue to be a partner with you in life, but I can't be a partner with you in life if you're hiding in the dark, if you're, if you're protecting those things. Um, would you want to pull up that uh, Cornelius one quote? This is uh, from a guy, got a cool name, Cornelius Plantiga, and it's out of a re really neat book, Not the Way It's Supposed to Be. And he, he describes in this book the way life shouldn't be and starts to pick out those things from that side. And he says, uh, self-deception is about our sin is a narcotic, a tranquilizing and disorienting suppression of our spiritual centered nervous, central nervous system. What's devastating about it is that we lack an ear for the wrong notes in our lives. We can't play the right ones or even recognize them in the performance of other people. Eventually we make ourselves so spiritually unmusical that we miss both the exposition and the recapitulation of the main themes that God is playing in human life. He uses a lot of big words in there. Meaning that if we're, what he's trying to say is, if we are continually hitting the wrong notes in life, if we aren't getting forgiveness and getting things straightened out with God, we're going to get to a point where we are self-deceived. We're not even going to see it in ourselves. So we need to keep uh, early, fast, quick repairing of relationship, of redemptive, of relationship forgiveness between God and ourselves. One of the things I... Uh, uh, I envy about, I shouldn't say envy, the Catholic Church, they do, and, and I, I've, all I've seen has been on uh, TV shows where there's a priest on one side and it's a confessional, and I think a guy sits on the, you come in, you sit on the other side, and you say, you know, oh, the Father, I have sinned, is what, uh, and then the guy says, what have you done, and he tells him, and and the idea of that, the, the idea that the priest can forgive his sins is not right, but the idea of getting it off your chest, getting it out in the open, is something I think we as an evangelical community are not doing well at all. 
uh, we don't have a place um, that we can go to tell someone who's not going to judge us or uh, uh, we, we just, I, I just, I just think we don't have a place like that. Like when I was out front earlier, we've got the um, Stephen Ministry, which is a great deal, and we deal with people's hurts and all that. But I think we need a Stephen Ministry for to find people who will not judge us, but will just listen to us. And some place we can go to say, you know, if, if you tell the pastor, sometimes you then you're sitting in church, you say, well, he knows what I just told him about something I did wrong, and that sometimes is uncomfortable, or you're not sure who I can talk to. And I think we need, in, in the church today, we need a place to go to say, you know, I, I've messed up. For, first, we need to go to God. That's the first thing. But then sometimes we need to get it off our chest and go to someone else for that healing to come. And so I, maybe before I'm dead, I'll see it. I don't know. But I think, that, I think that's something that would really help us to heal and to grow and to uh, not live under a cloud of guilt. And that's really what it's all about. God is not taking away the sin because he already did that. He takes away the guilt of sin. Um, turn to Psalm... Oh, where are we here? Psalm 32. We're going to check in with David again. I should have had Caleb put this one on the screen, but I thought of it too late. Psalm 32, 3 through 7. And it's uh, really a confession of David and what life was really like when things looked like from the outside, people looking at David and his uh, things he was doing as a king, things looked like they were decent, you know. He's a king, things are going good. And, and what, but yet what was inside was not going very well. And he puts that out in words on Psalm 32, 3 through 7. Would someone want to read that for us? My bones waste in the way through all my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you. No, I did not cover up my iniquity. <laughs> I said I would and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Going? We're going through se uh, seven. Therefore, I let anyone who is godly pray to you, while you may not, while you may be found. Surely, when the mighty waters rise, you will not reach him. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with the songs of deliverance. That is such a powerful section. I just. What, what, was, what was David like on the inside, according to that verse? Let's start with the very first verse, verse 3. Just, just read verse 3, if you would. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away from my groaning all day long. Would you have thought that of David as a king? He could, he could have changed anything in his kingdom. But what was going on inside? How did he describe it? He just rotten away. <laughs> yeah. My bones are wasting away, which, you know, how, that's a, like a deadly, that's like a cancer thing. That's a deadly thing, eating your bones. His, he felt like the inside of his body was wasting away. What does he say after that? For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. Okay. What, what, was, what was happening there? For day and night, What? God's hand was heavy on it. Yeah. He was feeling the pressure that yeah, he was feeling the pressure that wasn't there but was there. Yeah. The pressure was what? Guilt. For all of the things that he had done that came down to even murder. It was that that pressure. He said, Day and night your hand has been heavy on me. So God 
the pressure that he felt in his relationship with God was getting to him. Is that, do you start to feel some of the things that we, we live through like that? What's, what's the next verse? My strength was tapped. Okay. Like in the heat of summer. So what, what, how would that, what do, you, what, do you, what do you picture there? We get the heat of summer in July and August most of the time, not so much this way. Can't move forward. Yeah, it's hard to do a day's work out in the sun, isn't it? We took some uh, high school kids back in the day to Phoenix, and there, it's just unbelievable. Like oh, a, dry heat. <laughs> <laughs> a dry heat, not in July, I wasn't. <laughs> but the construction workers, there was nothing going on in the afternoon, but there was pounding and banging all night. So in this heat of the day, it just saps your strength. David felt like he had no more strength. And he was a warrior, a battler, someone who went out to war and was used to that kind of thing. And he said it was sapping his strength, this guilt, carrying this guilt. Then what else? Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. Okay. But then he did what? confessed, acknowledged it, gave God access to his heart. He acknowledged what was going wrong, said, this is what's been going wrong in my life, and gave him access. The next, the next part? And I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Forgave what? The guilt. Forgave the guilt of my sin. The sins are taken care of, what we carry around, and what John is talking about is that we get over, that we get past the guilt. The guilt can be just as bad as the sin. The guilt of what we've done can be worse than the sin. And so that's what John is after, is that we get past the guilty part. And the very last, uh, in verse 7, the last half, I read verse 7, is there's an interesting thing in there. A word he uses. Do you want to read that? You are my hiding place. There. You are my what? I thought we weren't supposed to hide. And he tells us to hide, doesn't he? Why is David saying that? You are my hiding place. Well, once he confessed his guilt. He was still hiding the guilt, but he was hiding it in God, not in the darkness. Yeah. Yep. He, didn't, he didn't confess it to the public. He confessed it to God. Yep. He took the guilt from him. Yeah. There, uh, I got a, there, was an old, there was an old hymn uh, talked about the cleft of the rock. Anybody remember that one? That is from way back. Yeah, it even hurts my head. <laughs> what was that? that be one of those Shadows of dry, thirsty land. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll have we'll come back here Wednesday afternoon. Thou <laughs> um, hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock. Yeah. Something about a dry, thirsty place. Yeah. The, the, truth, the truth is is that we need a hiding place, a protecting place, and God is that protecting place, not hiding in the dark, hiding from God, but hiding with God. It's, it's a, it's, I just think it's a cool, a cool section of verses that puts so much of what we feel and think about and hide, and Don is thinking about <laughs> I got him on that song now. <laughs> is it Rock of Ages? Yeah. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock. Go ahead, yeah. <laughs> That's the just, just saying, Tanya. Yeah. yeah. You got the song. Going. Stand up, would you? <laughs> yeah, that's a song. Yeah, that's a song. That's a song. 
go to go to God to hide things, go to, or hide in God is what he's after. Um, when we talked, uh, we talked a little. This this whole thing when we started what two and a half years ago or so, we started with Jesus as a rabbi, got into David and all, and and we've kind of centered in on the bullseye of Matthew last year and John First John this year, and um, uh, the idea is to get it to be. We can talk about everybody else in the Bible, but the idea is to get it more personal. So what is going to help me live my life? What is going to... Uh, in one of the verses we looked at, look up uh, Matthew 5. We'll zip back to Matthew 5, if you would, in the last 10 here. Erase my drawing of my yard. Remember, remember, we studied about Jesus said, I, I'm, I've got, I'm coming to you with some good news and bad news. The good news is that uh, you're, there's a kingdom life available to you. The bad news is that it's not coming through who you think, through the Pharisees and Sadducees. It's going to come from the poorest and the downtrodden. And so if, if you go to Matthew um, Actually, start with uh, I believe it's Matthew four. Uh, someone want to read Matthew four eighteen and nineteen? As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishing, fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. But once they left their nets and followed. Yep. Uh, I got the wrong verse. Oh, excuse me. Go up to, read 17. I was one verse two. It's verse 17. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Okay, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. And what we talked about is what, what did the children of Israel expect when he said that? No more enemies around us. Nobody's going to take over us. Nobody's going to haul us off to be exiles. But that isn't what Jesus meant because we go to Matthew 5. So he said the kingdom. And I'll put in the kingdom life is at hand. So living a kingdom life, living a life with God in a good relationship is at hand for you is what Jesus is saying. And then he goes to describe in Matthew 5. And the verse we're going to look at is 4. Verse 4. I think it's a second beatitude. Matthew 5, 4. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Okay. So we, these are all the blesseds. And this one says what? Blessed are who? Those who mourn. And we talked about how silly that sounded. For they shall be comforted. What we don't catch is that in, in uh, Greek, there's nine words for the word mourn. And the one that Jesus used then was uh, pantheo or pantheos, I believe which means to get, you've got all of this turmoil and all of this stuff inside. It's mourning is getting it outside. And we talked about that. You know, what are uh, Mideastern funerals like? Is there a lot of them? Oh, man. Yeah. It's the streets when you see pictures of it, especially somebody 
uh, important, well, even even uh, people that don't have a big place, the streets are filled with people and they, and they hire mourners, whalers, to come along, but there's a lot of whaling getting it out, and that's what Jesus was talking about. The, unless we, blessed are you, if you can get that, the stuff that you've hidden inside, if you can get that out, then you will be comforted. Then you're going to find peace and joy and happiness. But if you let all that stuff stay inside, Jesus, the opposite would be true. You're not going to be comforted. You're not going to find peace and joy in life. And so a, a key to it, which we are not used to in our German, Dutch, whatever culture we are, Polish. <laughs> I don't want to leave anybody out. In our culture, that's not something we do. We are, uh, I think in the, in the German, it was the Stillium Lunde, the quiet in the land. Uh, we don't express ourselves like that, so we keep things inside. Uh, it, it's hard, you know, but when someone dies in our family, it's, we really don't express it very well. We don't know how, and they do it, just bleh, it's all out there. And I think it is so healing for them, and we carry it around, carry it around, carry it around, and don't say anything to anybody unless it's someone close. And not, and not just death, but uh, things that we do wrong in life, or things that we feel guilty about, things that we haven't done right with God. We need to let that spill out to God, and then, if appropriate, to someone else. But most importantly, we need to spill it out to God. Um, turn back to First John. We'll close with these here. I'm giving you a lot of A lot of things to read here. First John two one. Someone have first John two one. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an adequate an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Okay. So what was the purpose of it in the first part of that verse? I write this to you so so you won't sin. So you won't continue to do things wrong. But if you do, I have a what? Advocate. What's a, what? What do we? What would we associate an advocate with in our society? A lawyer? Someone who speaks for us where? Where are you thinking? Defense lawyer, but we, it's in a legal kind of... In a legal setting? Is that what you were thinking too? I, no, I guess I wasn't really getting that deep into it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I mean, you know, someone who is pleading our case for us. It would be like a lawyerish type thing. So who is pleading our case. So we have an advocate with the Father who is Jesus Christ pleading our case. So when we do something wrong and uh, Satan is there accusing, saying, did you see what Ron did uh, out in the shop at his place? You know, that wasn't very Christian-like. And Jesus says, I know, but that was covered by my blood. That's an advocate with the Father. So that is, he says, that's all taken care of. Again, we're going back to that. And so what do we deal with? First John 1, 9, we go back to that. If we confess to our advocate, Jesus Christ, if we confess to him that we have done wrong, we're going to find peace and, and coming out of the hiding and, and pretending. The same was used in John 14, I think, about the comforter. So it goes back to him being a comforter. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So what, what comes after the release? Comfort. Just like, exactly right, like Matthew 5.4. So it is possible to do what Jesus said in Matthew 4.17, which you read, is to live a kingdom life. If we can get this 
I'm, I'm a formula guy. I love science and math and that stuff. I, I like formulas and I like pieces to fit together. And if we get this formula right of keeping short accounts with God, God forgives us. He's an advocate with the Father. Uh, he pushes Satan away so that he's not always accusing us. And he comforts and helps us to live a kingdom life. Uh, uh, does, that, does that make sense? You know, there, there, is, there is a way to not live under all of the guilt like David did. In, uh, we saw in was it, uh, Psalm 34, to not feel the way David felt. We can get out of that. We don't have to do that if we just get the formula right and then follow through and do it. Desire God, give God access, pay attention, and partner with God, fellowship with God. Another formula. I, I, I love it. <laughs> when it all fits together, when a plan all comes together, what was that from? That was some movie, wasn't it? Now I got done thinking. <laughs> I love it when a plan comes together. Okay, next next week we'll we'll go on back going. It was the eighteen. The eighteen was it? <laughs> oh man. <laughs> oh, sorry, Don. We have we'll, we'll continue on from so, so read for next week from. First John 1, 9, uh, on another three, four verses, we'll continue to, we're going to talk about uh, six things that will, that are benefits of living this way. What, there are going to be six things that we'll go over that are benefits from living in the light, because uh, getting out of the darkness into the light can be kind of a terrifying, stressful thing. But there's huge benefits, and that's what we're going to talk about next week, is the six benefits, or we'll get started on it. The six benefits of living in the light. What are what are they, and how can they help us and our children, our grandchildren, as we pass that down? How can we help them live a good life too? Okay, let's pray as we close. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for uh, your Holy Spirit as He teaches and guides us, and uh, uh, help us to learn to look to live a kingdom life. Learn learn to live openly with you and not try and hide how foolish that is. Uh, guide us as we go this week in the places we go that we will be a witness for you and share Christ with those we meet. In your name I pray. Amen.